Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Tom Hinsey. Uh, I've been asked to uh, MC this awesome panel on community health and safety. Cool. All right. How's everyone doing? All right. Thanks for coming, and thanks to the awesome uh, bike caravan that went around. My name is Tom Hintze, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I've been asked to MC this panel on why Davis needs a community health and safety department. So hopefully we're gonna talk for about 40 minutes. I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves uh, in a second. Um, and then we'll take answers, or questions, excuse me, hopefully answers uh, from other folks. So um, the first thing to say is this campaign has already had some major victories, y'all. We were able to pressure the city council to actually take homeless services out of the police department and give them to the city manager. So we're already making progress. And that's a big deal. Like people like me who were on the streets in New York City for a while, I had police hassling me all the time when I was sleeping in subways, ferry terminals, what have you. So that's a really big deal for a lot of people in this city. But we've got, we've got further to go. So um, anyway, I want to turn it over to the panelists now to introduce themselves, starting with... I think it's as loud as it goes, but I will try to project. Um, so my name is Morgan Poindexter. I'm a graduate student here at UC Davis, um, and I've been involved in this this campaign um, to reimagine public safety for the last year. Hi, I'm Nusrat Mola. I'm a third year PhD student at UC Davis, uh, and I'm a member of UAW 2065, and I've been involved in this campaign since the fall. Hello everyone, uh, uh, name is Sule Adibaba. Um I've been in Davis, living in Davis for 22 years now. Can't believe it's been that long. Um, I am currently, I currently work on campus as a, an advisor for athletics. Um, also, my second gig is uh, I work as a counselor, mental health counselor uh, for uh, group home in Davis, for mentally cha challenged boys. Hello everyone, my name is Kasia, uh, Kasia Johnston Hart. Um, I am a property manager at the Lexington Apartments on Olive Drive, uh, it's a student apartment complex. I'm also a co-chair at YOLO DSA, um, the Democratic Socialist of America. Yes. Yeah, so I think right now, uh, public safety, how we sort of think about it is we're thinking of um, police with guns as security guards protecting not even people, but like buildings, basically. Uh, our current police public safety, quote unquote, uh, consists of an armed body of people that are protecting the interests of the wealthy. Um, they're not protecting the people of this city. They're not protecting the people who need protecting. Um, most people in their day-to-day -day lives are not experiencing robbery and especially in Davis um, and violent crime. Uh, much, much, much more often the kind of safety that they're dealing with is homelessness, food insecurity, mental health problems. And so the way that we want to start imagining public safety is actually addressing those things, um, the issues that real people are actually dealing with that make them unsafe. Here's some question. How would you imagine public safety in Davis? Uh, I actually had a situation about two weeks ago where, um, so I didn't tell you all, uh, my responsibility at the group home is to, I'm, a, I'm the nine staff uh, supervisor. So what I do is I'm sleeping at night, when one of the kids runs away, they call me, I have to go looking for them. Or if there's any kind of uh, intense situation, imminent situation, they call me, I show up. So two weeks ago, I was uh, going to Safeway in uh, West Davis. There was an unhoused individual uh, who was a person of color. So this is where it gets uh, really interesting. They were intersection with this individual. Unhoused, food insecure, mental health, I mean, I think it was some kind of psychosis going on, right? So he was leaving some food in the trash, and at some point, he was pushing carts down the parking lot. And folks were freaking out because the carts were being hit by the cart. So, an individual was my friend, but I got there, he was calling the cops. Because in his brain, the first thing to do is, there's a social unrest, let me call the cops. So once he called the cops, I was like, oh shoot, I wish you told me I don't done that. 
So I figured I should do something. I'm, I'm trained to uh, you know, verbally uh, de-escalate individuals uh, with mental health uh, issues. So I, I went and I approached uh, the man. And I, I remember approaching him, he was really, really aggressive, but like, don't come near me. And first thing he was, don't come close to me. I was like, all right, it's okay. I'm just here because I'm worried about you. So what do you mean? I said, well, someone just called the cops. And I'm worried that the cops will show up, but I didn't warn you. This might be your last break, last time you're pretty much alive. He was like, oh, really? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm literally here to warn you. So we're talking, as I'm talking to him, I was mindful not to get too close to him, so that you know, the non-verbal he was giving me, and slowly, I mean, it was crazy because his affect changes. It's like, this guy cares about me. Absent an entire overturning of the culture of policing, um, they just need to not be the responders because, as you said, they are not approaching the situation using tried and true um, public health, well researched, documented, evidence based ways to de escalate a situation. And even when they're trained in de escalation, it is a small, tiny tool that they might use if they feel like it. Um, and it's not the culture, it's not what they think about, it's not um, it's not what they were trained to do. And, and that's not, uh, I, I like to think about it personally, and, and maybe some people would disagree, but I like to think about it on a systemic level. Sure, well, I can talk about my personal experience with policing, um, which wasn't in Davis, but as we know, Davis isn't necessarily an exception. Um, and so I, my brother uh, has a developmental disability. Uh, and when he aged out of the public school system, he didn't have anything to do all day. And he'd sit at home and we couldn't find resources for him. We couldn't get um, any caretakers to come to the home and like engage with him and like do activities with him. And so he sat at home and he started running away. Um, and it was at all times of day, it would be at 5 a.m. in the morning, and we, he's nonverbal, he can't speak. Uh, he is able to take public transit though, so he could get far away. <laughs> and it was so scary, and we would constantly have to be calling the police. And at some point, it was a weekly occurrence almost. We would call the police, they, you know, we are, we're on a first name basis. And we never got the actual help we needed, you know? We would just call, that was our only choice was to call the police. But when it came to actually getting the resources we needed, and it was so clear how helpless we were, you know, um, we couldn't pay for these kinds of services. Um, and my mom is an immigrant, so like her English wasn't the best. And so when it came to like actually getting the help to navigate the system, we didn't get that. We only had the police. And my my brother, um, it's we've had issues with like people losing their temper with them, you know just like teachers and caretakers and stuff and so the idea that he could be intercepted by police and an armed officer could potentially you know lose their temper with him was a constant fear um and like not far from where we grew up just like one county over ethan sailor was a man with disability with autism killed by police and I really think you know it's just a matter of what it, it could have been my brother so there needs to be another option for families uh, with children with disabilities there needs to be someone else we can call who's trained to handle it takes a special set of skills I don't expect just anyone to do it especially not a person with the training that cops get that's just one of the things so in my mind, for traffic enforcement, it's very, very simple. Just divorce it entirely. It is not criminal. I mean, some, some things, DUIs, sure, that's a criminal offense, all right, involving vehicles. But really, a lot of traffic stuff, a broken taillight, why is there not just a traffic person who is not armed who just says, hey, I can fix that for you. Do you want me to fix that? Thanks. Have a good day. Be safe. I mean, right? Or, or if you're speeding, hey, please don't do that. Here's your $150 fine. Slap on the wrist. Um, but, but it doesn't require anything. That, that There's no need for the interaction between the criminal system 
and traffic enforcement in the way that our society has it set up right now. And a lot of it gets talked about, well, until, you know, state laws change, blah, 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 we can't do anything. But honestly, I mean, there are cities who have stopped enforcing minor traffic violations specifically to get around this problem. So honestly, city council, um, you know, let's let's make an, an ordinance that we are no longer pulling people over for expired registration. We're no longer harassing black and brown people in our community, which we know that we are because of the RIPA data. Like I've looked at the data. It is, it is true that we are pulling over and detaining especially a lot of black people in Davis and then letting them go because they did no crime. That's horrible. I mean, that is literally the definition of racial profiling. And honestly, I mean, Chief Pytella at the April 6th city council meeting said it basically, you know, he said the quiet part loud, um, which I was really surprised by. He said outright that he stops or he, he pulls over um, and, and runs the plates on cars that look like they don't belong. There's a lot of us who work here in Davis, right? We've been talking about the white moderates and I think rightfully so, but there's a lot of workers in Davis who also live here who really care about this, right? And we need to make sure that those people are aware of the campaign and are gonna come out to vote also. We can build the power to do it, I think. So we should we should find our coworkers, reach out to them, build our networks. Um, and finally, I just wanted to thank all of our panelists, Keja, Sule, Nusrat, Morgan, and thank you all for coming.